All right. Welcome, folks. Welcome to another co-opting AI session while you are entering the room, sitting down, kicking back, relaxing. It's five o'clock here in New York. I take all of you had a long day. It's April after all. Spring's around the corner. So for some people, it's already there. For us, not quite yet, but we're getting there. Um, I'm very excited for today's conversation. And um, while you're all settling in, I am going to start and welcome you all and also introduce our wonderful panelists today. So my name is Mona Sloan. I'm a sociologist here at NYU. I study the intersection of technology and society, and I focus on artificial intelligence. I am a research assistant professor at the NYU Tennis School of Engineering and a senior research scientist at the NYU Center for Responsible AI, and importantly, have been for a good long while a fellow here at NYU's Institute for Public Knowledge, where I've been covering or convening, I should say, the Co-opting AI series since early 2019, so pre-pandemic, another life or two. This series would be impossible without very generous support through that we received through the Institute for Public Knowledge, but also the NYU Center for Responsible AI, the 370J Project, and the Department of Technology, Culture, and Society at NYU Tendon. And a huge thanks to all of these folks who keep supporting the series so that I can bring in all these terrific thought leaders into our space. Now, today we're talking about something that currently everybody is talking about, which is AI and language. But <clears throat> before we begin our conversation, and um, start the kind of engagement with this very big and important topic, I want to acknowledge that I am currently located on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples, and I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community and perhaps the indigenous communities on whose land you may be currently uh, located, and also to commit to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Now, since ChatGPT, the intelligent chat bot by OpenAI, entered the scene of our everyday life, conversations about sentient AI have been reinvigorated, as have critical voices. The question if there will ever be a general artificial intelligence or AGI is an old one, of course, but there seems to be something new about the ways in which large language models or LLMs, such as ChatGPT, find their way into our everyday lives. Just last week, the New York Times published a piece that documented the quote, 35 ways in which real people are using AI right now. Many cases were actually language AI based and they ranged from various forms of planning, meal planning, garden planning, workout planning, to product design or writing, emails, wedding speeches or Excel formulas, to transcribing such as clinical notes. That's actually uh, Alison Kinnick's topic, but I'm not going to say more now. It also included um, things such as coping with ADHD or dyslexia. And so the ways in which language AI, even ever so slightly, reconfigures our social activity and social lives seems really endless at this point, or at least our imagination around that. Um, but AI and language have always co-developed. After all, language plays a big role in how we as humans learn and make sense of the world. And er actually early government funded AI was focused on developing machines that could transcribe and translate spoken language. In other words, there wouldn't be AI without language and linguistics. So, with this event today, we are um, we very decidedly want to co-opt the ChatGPT 
discourse and explore the critical intersection of these algorithmic technologies with human speech, but also meaning making. And I have two very dynamic and wonderful and forward thinking scholars as my guests today, who are both really uniquely positioned to guide us through this exploration. Alison Kinnicky and Sayash Kapoor. Beginning today, will be Alison Kinnicky, who is an assistant professor of information science at Cornell University. Her research interests lie broadly at the intersection of economics and computer science with a focus on algorithmic fairness. Her projects applied computational methods, including machine learning and causal inference to study societal inequities in domains from online services to public health. Allison is regularly quoted as an expert on racial disparities and automated speech to text systems. Previously, she was a postdoc at Microsoft Research in England in the Machine Learning and Statistics Group. And before that, she, excuse me, received her PhD from Stanford's Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering. Excuse me. Understandably, talking about math has that effect on people. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to continue my own intro. Um, so I finished my PhD at Stanford Institute for Mathematical, um, Computational Mathematical Engineering um, and broadly work on algorithmic fairness. Um, Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Definitely, yeah. Um, I'm Sarah Kapoor. I'm a PhD candidate at Princeton University's Center for Information Technology Policy where I work with Professor Arvind Narayanan on AI and how AI, like what AI cannot do, uh, broadly speaking. We're also writing a book together right now called AI Snake Oil. Um, and a lot of the work that I'll be presenting today is uh, things we've, been, we've done together over the last couple of years. So I'm very excited to be talking to you all. Thank you and apologies for that. Alison, why don't you kick us off? Will do. And I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, does that look good? Perfect. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about AI and language, but more specifically, uh, thinking about the biases of language models, the data that feed into the language models, and broadly this bigger commercial pipeline um, of AI and language. Uh, and so to start, um, kind of cluing into this uh, notion that I work on a lot of speech to text uh, applications. Um, does this matter, right? This is kind of the big question that a lot of folks think about when there is this uh, kind of default thought of like, oh, speech to text is like asking Siri a question or setting a timer on uh, your echo, for example, right? So do these things actually matter? Um, and in fact, they're actually really important in a lot of different cases. Um, so, for example, individuals with disabilities often rely on speech to text if they uh, don't have physical use um, ways to interact with the web, for example. These things are in cars now. Uh, these things are in, uh, as Mona alluded to, uh, medical devices that doctors uh, can use to speak into and uh, it'll automatically transcribe patient notes. Um, and these are also used in court transcriptions, right? So normally you have a human who is a court transcriber who transcribes all the happenings and now these are um, these folks are slowly being phased out um, and speech to text is taking over. And so you can imagine if that, you know, these speech to text uh, services are biased, then you have massive downstream effects, whether it's messed up patient notes, incorrect trial transcripts, um, all sorts of things could go wrong. Uh, and so what I'm showing here is kind of the headline takeaway from uh, one of my papers where we studied five different firms, uh, Apple, IBM, Google, or Amazon, Microsoft, um, and all of their speech-to-text APIs. Uh, and what we found was that actually the error rates were roughly doubled um, worse for black speakers relative to white speakers, right? And so on average across these firms, uh, roughly there were 19% uh, errors for white speakers compared to 35% errors for black speakers. Um, so clearly this is a prevalent problem. Um, this paper was as of 2020. Um, and I'll segue from there into telling you that dystopia is already here, right? So I, I'm like broadly worried about this. And here's one 
uh, example as to why. So there is a service called uh, Veris run by Leo Technologies. And what they do is they basically tap into uh, jails and prisons phone calls and they listen to incarcerated people's speech. What they do then is take those voice recordings and then plug them into AWS. Um, you may recall Amazon is on this slide, uh, right? And it does have this doubled worst error rate uh, for black relative to white speakers in the US. Um, now, what this technology is doing is they're looking at the transcriptions from Amazon uh, and then just doing a basic histogram, just counting up what words are being said. And then if inmates are saying words uh, that are on some sort of keyword list, like maybe guns, um, then decisions are made about their incarceration. So for example, putting someone in solitary confinement. Um, and obviously there are all sorts of, you know, questions about surveillance and ethics and that sort of thing. Uh, but one thing I wanna point out, um, and this is a screen cap directly from uh, this technology's website, uh, is that they claim that there's no implicit bias and no racial profiling because they're simply taking the speech and not inputting any specific data about race, right? And so hopefully you can see where I'm going with this. In fact, there is a lot of implicit bias because they're using speech to text technology that inherently is worse on different demographics, right? So if, for example, the word gonna is mistranscribed uh, disproportionately much for black speakers relative to white speakers, um, then that's gonna have really uh, strong and negative implications. Okay, so removing ourselves from dystopia and, and getting back to kind of speech to text and language models. Um, what, what does speech to text actually have to do with language models, right? So broadly, there are two components that work together to transcribe your speech. One is a language model, I used to have to do a lot of work to describe this, but now I can just wave my hands and say like, this is chat GPT, right? So it's what describes what you're saying. Uh, whereas acoustic models deal with how you're saying things. So this is gonna be things like stress and intonation and prosody and all, all of those other sorts of things. Um, and, and I will say that one of the big findings from our uh, PNAS paper is that actually the majority of uh, issues, uh, the underlying reason that we think that there are these massive disparities in word error rate are from the acoustic model. So a lot of it actually has to do with um, speech to text models not being very good um, at understanding African-American English uh, in terms of the, the stress and intonation and other acoustic features. That being said, because the theme of today is language, uh, I'll focus mostly on the language models uh, today uh, and just give a few examples of where language models tend to fail uh, for black speakers. And so one example here is with the habitual B. Uh, so AAE is the African-American English formulation um, of a habitual B where you would say I be in my office by 7.30. So the incorrect way that a lot of standard English speakers might interpret this is I will be, but that's actually not what this means. This would be more accurately transcribed as uh, something like I am usually, I am habitually in my office by 7.30. Uh, and Martin and Tang have this great paper um, from Interspeech uh, 2020 where they again look at the word error rates and they found that habitual B, so the uh, African-American English formulation on the left column uh, is far, far lower relative to the standard American English formulation of non-habitual B. Um, and this is true across both of the uh, speech to text services that they looked at. So that's one example where uh, language models have failed. Um, another is called the zero copula. So this is where one drops the copula. Uh, so the, the letters in red are where the copula is. So for example, the quote unquote standard American English version of the sentence would be he is a pastor. Uh, the African American English formulation would be he a pastor without the copula, without the apostrophe S. Uh, and we find what one might expect. Uh, I'll explain briefly. The metric here is called perplexity. Uh, and this is basically a measure of confusion. So you can think of it as how confused is the model when it sees the sequence of words. Um, and so the model that we used here, one of the earlier versions of GPT was very perplexed um, at the AV formulations uh, of zero with a zero copula and not very confused about the standard English formulations, right? So we pretty consistently see this pattern of quote unquote standard English um, being something that the model understands uh, and African-American English being something that the model is uh, just more confused by has worse uh, accuracy on, uh, generally doesn't have as much exposure to. Uh, before I show these next slides, I, I do want to caveat that I, I like the, the tweets that have examples from ChatGPT, but I also think that they are very much meant to be, you know, just one-off examples that don't necessarily show the entire picture. 
That being said, these papers are from 2020. So what's going on today? Um, from two days ago, I asked ChatGPT, how grammatically accurate is the sentence he a pastor? Um, and ChatGPT says, this is not grammatically accurate. It's missing is. But pointedly, if I ask them, um, how can someone say he is a pastor using African-American English? Uh, ChatGPT actually gives me both of the grammatical formulations that we just talked about. So he a pastor, that's with a zero copula. He be a pastor, that's with the habitual be. So, you know, ChatGPT is capable of figuring out these grammatical formulations, um, but they just, ChatGPT doesn't consider this accurate, right? And again, this is one off example, not meant to say that across the board, across all grammatical examples, uh, ChatGPT necessarily does this, but um, I found this to be an interesting example. Okay, so the rest of what I want to talk about is just regarding what leads into these biases. And a lot of that has to do with the underlying data, right? So perhaps uh, no surprise, a lot of the training data that goes into these models, whether it's language models, acoustic models, or speech to text, so some sort of combination of these um, is, you know, standard American English, right? Um, and the question is, well, like why don't we just inject more black speaker data into these models, uh, into the training data? Um, so it would be great uh, for companies to do this. And I very much encourage companies to do this. But one reason um, that this often is not done is because of quality filters. So for example, um, instead of scraping literally all the data from the internet, usually there are some sort of quality filters for like, you know, if uh, sentences are, you know, not actually fully written out or if things are not in, in the right language, for example, those are gonna get filtered out. This is something that a lot of companies do for online ad text, for example, there are just basic quality filters. And oftentimes it's very likely that things formulated in African-American English get filtered out. Another reason that companies might not by default be doing this uh, is because it actually takes a lot of effort and expertise to correctly transcribe uh, these speech patterns, right? So if you just have voice data and you need to have some ground truth written text um, in order to train these models, um, the act of actually writing that text transcription is something that takes a lot of effort and you have to know what the different AB formulation, African-American vernacular English formulations are. You have to have the time and resources and linguistics background and particular training in African-American English to do this correctly. Um, so there is just a lot of work that goes into it. Um, and then the third reason I have for kind of why a lot of the training data fails to capture black speakers, for example, um, has to do with this feedback loop, right? Where if you are an iPhone user and you regularly use Siri, your voice is going to be continued, continually used as training data because the more you interact with it, the more voice uh, is being captured of yours um, and so on and so forth. But if you're a black speaker and you try using Siri once and it just doesn't work for you, so you stop using it, your voice is no longer going to be continually uh, you know, added to the training set because you're not actually interacting with the product, right? And so you have this kind of pernicious uh, positive feedback loop that continues to happen where existing users for whom these technologies already work really well will continue to, to feed their data in as uh, part of this training data pipeline, which just doesn't work for a subset of the population. So, this also isn't just limited to, you know, I've mostly talked about uh, black speakers and white speakers. Um, this is broadly a, a worry of mine along a lot of different dimensions. So of course, we've already mentioned that quote unquote standard American English is the norm, uh, but that means that non-native English accents or um, different types of uh, speech such as healthy voices uh, versus quote unquote un atypical speech. Um, also see a lot of differences, right? So dysphonia, for example, or aphasia or stutters, individuals who are speaking uh, not as most of the training data are, um, are often going to be transcribed at lower accuracies. You have a similar issue with uh, a lot of things that are actually quite correlated with socioeconomic status. So things like having high quality mics if you're speaking into an iPhone versus, for example, like a very old, older technology, um, that's going to have a, a big difference if you're in a very noisy setting, um, if you live with a lot of people and it's very loud, um, that's going to be different from if you have a very clean studio recording um, set of speech that you're training your models on. So there are a lot of places where actually there's quite a lot of bias, um, especially with this feedback loop. 
Um, I'm also broadly worried about the lack of documentation for a lot of uh, beach data. And so to that end, small pitch uh, on my own behalf, uh, we have a forthcoming paper at FACT this summer um, that puts out data sheets, augmented data sheets for speech specific data sets. Um, and then lastly, of course, kind of all of the ethical questions of uh, any sort of data collection also very much apply here, right? You have to think about consent, you have to think about privacy, um, even more so given that voice is very much like a health biomarker. And so how do you actually differentiate between uh, speech data for health? Like, is it HIPAA, et cetera, et cetera? Um, there are a lot of questions to unpack there. Um, and so I'll end with a few calls to action. So firstly, it's really important to collect more diverse data. So this applies to all non-standard varieties of English, atypical speech types, um, differential recording qualities, all, all sorts of things. Another is to invest resources. Um, and I'll point out that this isn't just a data problem, it's also very much a people problem. If you have people in the commercial pipeline who are able to stand up and say, oh, I don't think this technology is actually fully inclusive, or you know, I've, you know, have we actually tested this on different um, speech types? That's really, really important to have. Uh, another is to do audits and make sure that companies are regularly auditing their products. Uh, and finally, I think it's really important to also learn from other domains. Kind of the classic example here is from the gender chase paper by Joy Bulamwini and Tina Gebru, um, where they were actually able to, as a result of their auditing research, um, have some effect on IBM uh, and various other facial recognition um, sellers not selling their uh, technology to police departments. Okay. So with that, I'll turn it over. All right, I'll very quickly br bring up my slides. All good? Awesome. So before I begin, I should say like, it's a real privilege to be here and talk to you all. Um, also a privilege to be speaking right after Alison, whose work I've admired for the longest time now. Um, so today I'll be talking about language and AI hype. Uh, no big surprises, this session is called language. But I'll be using the word language in two different senses. So we have language models, language as in like models which are used to sort of um, model how we uh, talk and how like things like chat GPT. But I'll also be using language in the second sense of the language that we use to describe AI. Um, and over the course of like the next eight to 10 minutes, uh, we'll go over different sort of stakeholders who are involved in developing, but also spreading the hype about AI. Um, and hopefully that can set us up for some discussion later on about where we can sort of pinpoint sources of hype and what we can do about it. I should also note that most of this is joint work done with my advisor, Professor Arvind Narayanan at Princeton. Um, and this was also work that we've been doing um, as like we are writing the book, uh, it's called AI Snake Oil, and we're blogging about it on the URL on the screen. All right, with all that said, let's dive in. So last month, OpenAI released GPT-4, which was heralded as like one of the greatest advances in language technology um, all across the world. Um, as uh, Dr. Sloan mentioned earlier, it has received glowing reviews from people. It's all over the internet. It's being utilized by different people towards different things. Here, I want to focus on one sentence that um, OpenAI included in the abstract of the technical report it released. So OpenAI says the GPT-4 exhibits human level performance on various professional and academic benchmarks, including passing a simulated bar exam with a score around the top 10% of test takers. Now, if you're someone who hasn't really sort of been inside embedded in the field of AI, this might seem like a completely astonishing, mind-blowing result, right? Like GPT-4 can perform as well as um, lawyers on real-world tasks that, that they take years to train for. But if you dig just a little bit deeper, you see that the claims here are actually just a little bit misleading. So AI, and, and just to be clear here, like OpenAI is not the only offender here. Um, lots of AI vendors try to compare um, their tools to human performance, but the way that they do it is where I'll point out a few issues. So for one, a lot of the benchmarks that are used for evaluating language models today are also included in the training data for models. So this is what we call the problem of contamination. And 
for like a few of the benchmarks that OpenAI released, though probably not the legal one, um, the comparison that OpenAI did was, was with these contaminated benchmarks. The issue here is that if a model has already seen that training data, which, is, which it's being evaluated on, any measure of performance that we can uh, estimate is probably an overestimate. So the measure is probably an exaggeration uh, compared to what it would be. The next level on the hierarchy of evaluating AI tools is a comparison on benchmarks that are not contaminated. So say we create a new benchmark for a new setting. And this is what um, OpenAI did for specifically for the bar exam, though not for all of the other benchmarks that they reported. This is a step above because the model has not already seen the data that it was uh, that it's being evaluated on during training. And so this is a little bit more realistic. But the bug does not stop here. Um, there are like several other things that sort of developers need to do to make sure that their models are actually human level or actually useful in the real world. But the dominant paradigm today is that benchmark numbers are considered the be-all and end-all for reporting model performance. Um, in fact, a very famous sort of quote uh, from back in the day goes that every time I fire a linguist, the performance of my language model goes up. So the dominant perception in the AI community is that you don't need domain expertise. You don't need qualitative evaluations of AI tools in order to see if they're useful in the real world. Um, and, and we disagree. So I think one of the main things that's missing from current approaches to evaluating AI is actually seeing how well professionals can use it. In the absence of such um, like studies, in the absence of qualitative research, we have AI uh, experts making absurd, bizarre claims about the usefulness of AI. So Jeffrey Hinton, who's considered one of the godfathers of deep learning, back in 2016, said that in the next five years, radiologists will be obsolete. Um, medical AI imaging using AI would be much better than radiologists. And I think he said something to, be, to the effect of, like, it's extremely obvious that we need to stop training radiologists right now. Seven years later, we are nowhere close to being like, rid of the need for radiologists. So this is just one of the many examples in which like the AI community and especially companies which have a profit motive use benchmarks to give misleading, to provide misleading claims about the efficacy of AI tools in the real world. Another issue with corporate influence over AI research is just the fact that there's so much of it. So as Meredith Whitaker very eloquently points out in her article, The Steep Cost of Capture, AI research in the in industry has become incre increasingly enmeshed with AI research in academia to the extent that it's almost like you, you wouldn't be sort of too far off mistaking one for the other. What has happened is, here is that so much of industrial money has come into academic labs that it's almost as, as if academic research centers are offshoots of industrial labs. Um, now, this might not seem like a big deal if you think that both industry and academia are well aligned in their goals of making AI tools that can be broadly utilized by the public at large. But it, it does have a severe sort of stifling effect on the critical side, side of academia. So what we see here is that because of so many industrial ties, because so much of academic research is increasingly enmeshed with the industry, Academia is it's losing its critical job of you know, providing a critique of what the industry is doing, looking for alternative methods compared to the dominant paradigms within the industry. And I think we're all like much worse off because of this dynamic. Now, this dynamic isn't like only prevalent in AI, right? It's also prevalent in many other STEM fields, um, including in medicine. The key issue that I feel, um, the key dynamic that is missing though in AI is that these critiques of industrial corporate capture of AI research have not yet entered the mainstream, as opposed to, for instance, in medicine, when you have mainstream books being written about um, how like big pharma can sort of manipulate results. And it is a well-established phenomenon um, which, which is treated critically almost everywhere. In contrast, um, I think when articles like the one in the previous slide are released, critical tech scholars have always had to face a lot of pushback. So this view is far from mainstream within the tech community. Um, and I think there is a lot of work to be done here. Another place in which researchers and AI research has led to sort of exaggerated claims about the efficacy of AI is due to the reproducibility crisis. So over the last five years, 
There have been several cell studies which highlight the dire state of reproducibility, both in AI research and in scientific research that uses AI. One of the issues is that when we're in the presence of like a crisis or when we're in the presence of lack of reproducibility, almost any research result that is um, claimed likely, is likely an overestimate. It's not an underestimate. So it's not like we have a noisy but clear image of where AI research is heading. In fact, we have a systematically um, exaggerated view of how impactful AI can be for real world problems. Um, one of the reasons for uh, this, this sort of crisis is definitely like publication bias. Positive results are more likely to be published than negative ones. But yet another one is also the reliance on industry. So here I'll come back to the example of OpenAI. Um, one of the APIs that OpenAI had released, which was used in hundreds of academic papers, was called Codex. A few weeks ago, with just three days of notice, OpenAI dep uh, deprecated this API, which means that hundreds of these papers are no longer reproducible. Um, so the point here is a larger one, like when so much of academic research relies on large tech companies, which are driven by profit motives, reproducibility becomes an afterthought. It's a second thought as opposed to being the sort of front and center of how we carry out um, academic research. All right, so we've covered companies, we've covered researchers. There's one more party that we'll talk about, which is responsible for spreading quite a bit of hype around AI, and that's public figures. So uh, last month, you may have seen this very sort of prominent letter, which was signed by many, many big names like Elon Musk, Eric Schmidt, and so on, uh, about pausing giant AI experiments. So this was a letter which claimed that the threat due to language models is so large and the exist it's so existential that we should stop training any language models bigger than GPT-4. Now, it's true that language models have a large number of harms. And I think we'll come to many of those in uh, the panel discussion today as well. But the key sleight of hand that letters and initiatives like these make is that they put the focus entirely on some speculative risks, as opposed to the real risks that are already happening right now. So like here, this, this is an analysis we carried out of the kinds of things that were uh, claimed in the letter. So the letter claimed that we'll soon be flooded with an entire trove of malicious disinformation because of language models. But it entirely glosses over the risk of over-reliance, which is something that's already happening today, which has been shown time and time again, that humans are susceptible to automation bias, even if we know that a lang uh, an AI tool is like not really dependable, or even if we otherwise would have taken the right decision, in the presence of an automated decision-making system, we tend to over-rely on it. Similarly, in labor impact, the letter says that LLMs will replace all jobs. Um, in, in fact, it hints at the fact that should we replace all labor, even if it is um, valuable or like uh, creative and so on. But the fact is that LLMs are already leading to a lot of labor exploitation. They're already leading to centralized power in the hands of these big tech companies. We don't need to wait for models that are larger than GPT-4 or models that can cause existential risks to address this labor impact. Finally, this letter and like similar letters in the past point out the long-term existential risks that arise due to AI. Now, there is some value in thinking about these existential risks, but the fact is that the hype around AGI leading to like um, existential risks has become so predominant today in mainstream AI discourse that it has entirely sort of taken our um, attention away and led to misplaced priorities around things like near-term security risks. So one example is that nearly all of the language models that have been released so far are extremely vulnerable to this very simple technique called prompt injection. Now, it's no big deal if you're just relying on chat GPT for like a random conversation or generating fun memes or whatever. But as soon as you start putting in these systems into like your own day-to-day, -day, if you use a language model on your, let's say uh, your mobile phone to manage your personal calendar or something, uh, injecting a prompt would be as simple as sending you a calendar invite that asks your language model to do something other than what it what you wanted it to do. And to be clear, like these threats have been shown time and time again to be um, sort of uh, they, they affect all language models that have been released so far. And as of yet, there is no known um, like fail safe against these. Despite these issues, these language models have been adopted across like extremely um, vulnerable domains, extremely important domains, like for instance, with Bing and GPT-4. 
So in the presence of all this hype, um, one question is like, okay, we have companies, researchers, and these public figures talking about AI hype. How does it reach the public? Here's how it reaches the public. So this is a set of headlines that we collected soon after chat GPT and actually Bing was uh, made public. All of these are from prominent news outlets. And most of them question whether these models have become sentient. Now, to be clear, the text in these articles in most cases is um, a bit more balanced. But the fact that journalism has become click driven, the fact that catchy headlines are what are most important to journalists' bottom line now, leads to these sort of sensational headlines which, have, which risk misleading the public about what the threats of AI actually are. And um, actually, this is not something that is isolated to language models. In fact, back in September, we analyzed uh, a large corpus of 50 news articles about AI. And we, thought, we found, found out that almost each of these articles suffered from one of the pitfalls that we've um, like shown here. So these 18 pitfalls were recurring. They happened across articles from things like the New York Post to things like the New York Times. Um, and in the presence of this hype, it is hard for the public to take claims about AI critically, to evaluate critically whether these tools are actually useful or actually valuable in the real world um, or not. And one thing that leads to these claims becoming even more sticky in, in the public imagination is our susceptibility for cognitive biases. So we've already seen one such bias, um, automation bias, our tendency to over-rely on automated decision-making systems. Um, another one is um, our tendency to be primed. So science fiction, science fiction has like long primed us to equate AI with robots. And journalists and public figures sort of back, cash in on these um, associations. So for instance, this is a CNN article uh, which talks about AI being as effective as medical specialists at diagnosing disease. Um, it shows a robot arm shaking hands with a human. But the key thing is the uh, new AI tool being talked about in this article had nothing to do with robots. It was just something that was crunching numbers. So we're at this stage where even linear regression models have cover images of robots attached to them when the news articles are covering them. And this misleads the public a lot more than you know just descriptions of um, AI tools would, would have. Uh, and as, as a result, I think we risk misinforming the public and it, the onus is on us to make sure that this does not happen. Okay, so let's take a very quick step back. Um, I shared like a lot of sources of AI hype. I'll just quickly bring them all together. So, so here's a hypothesis for how AI hype spreads and how this feedback loop is sustained. So we have companies which are profit driven and they make tall claims without any transparency. At the same time, research in AI is suffering from a reproducibility crisis. So both of these together mean that most AI results that reach the public are likely to be exaggerated. Public figures like the um, letter from the Future of Life Institute, uh, they use these results at face value and they, they use these results to make points that are like larger than what we've already seen, which are these grand claims about AI doom, but they distract from the real issues in doing so. And this leads to AI hype that is rampant in the media. This feedback loop is completed when journalists uncritic uncritically report on this AI hype and our cognitive biases affect our perceptions of AI. So this is like our hypothesis for how AI hype persists. Um, and with that, I'll end my presentation. Thank you so much both for these great presentations. And again, my apologies for losing my voice just there, I didn't get to um, give you the warm welcome and the huge gratitude for being here. So thank you again for that. And thank you for um, your great points that you just uh, raised. So um, we're gonna have a little bit of a panel conversation or panel discussion. Meanwhile, audience members as per usual are encouraged and welcome to put questions and comments into the Q&A box at the bottom right of your Zoom screen. And I will bring those in um, as we move through the conversation because we want to make sure we 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 bring in the audience. Um, so Sayash, I'm gonna kind of stay with you with a question. You just kind of very eloquently outlined um the 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 hype the AI hype loop. Uh, and the ways in which it sort of sustains itself or is being sustained and we're all kind of complicit with that. 
And I want to bring that sort of more concretely back to large language models and the chat GPT induced renewed AI hype that we are seeing. Um, is there, I mean, AI hype and imaginations around in human-like intelligent machines are really old, right? They've been around for a very long time. So I'm curious um, to hear your thoughts on whether LLMs actually are a new thing. Are they, or is, you know, are the narratives the same? Are the capabilities the same? Or is there something really new here? In other words, is this really just hype or is is it is it a different kind of hype or are we actually seeing a, a sort of sea change in the way in which this this particular technology affects our lives? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So I think there is one significant change compared to earlier cycles of hype, which sort of affects our ability to take these claims critically. And that is, in my view, it's public adoption. So chat GPT has been used by a hundred million plus people. I think we can like easily say that that makes the technology mainstream. For prior cycles of hype, all you could sort of really do was believe the experts or believe um, like people who are selling you something. You didn't really have that level of firsthand experience or the public didn't have that firsthand experience with that technology to be awed by it. And to be clear, I do think that like for someone who's coming across chat GPT for the first time, being awed by it is like a perfectly reasonable response, right? Um, but at the same time, I think we are underprepared in terms of like public communication about its impacts, about the fact that it's just another tool that you can use for a few things. And at the same time, it's nothing compared to like human intelligence. So making sure that the public avoids that category error is I think where um, we like as a community of critical scholars have sort of fallen behind. Yeah, thank you for that. And I appreciate the the number that you gave us here with 100 million people who have used ChatGPT, that's quite remarkable. Um, Allison, I know that you are actually very active in the AI audit space and, you know, you've published uh, audits and critical examinations of speech to text tools. Um, and so I wonder, as we sort of see this real integration of large language models and you know, quote unquote, language AI in our social lives, but we also continue to see issues around bias, especially racial bias, gender bias, bias against people with a disability or speech impairment. How do you see a path forward for continuing meaningful AI audit work? Honestly, I, I think the role that auditing plays is kind of like whack-a-mole. So we can highlight issues the best we can, but as soon as companies, you know, start to collect more of the relevant data, uh, there's always more to find and there's always more to improve on. Um, so I think auditing and doing this kind of long-term reporting of progress um, is going to continually surface these sorts of disparities. And to some degree, that's a good thing, right? It's always good to know what's on the horizon in terms of how um, different services can improve. Um, but, but it does kind of, uh, make one realize how flawed all of these services are. Um, and that's not to say that that means they're bad and should be entirely banned and no one should use them. There are still very valid use cases um, of, uh, for example, ChatGPT. I'm seeing one of the questions in the chat um, about like appropriate uses. And a great use is, you know, trying to code faster, for example. Um, but on, on the flip side, there are some really serious and dangerous downstream consequences that are maybe a step removed from there. Um, and I don't see issues of uh, fairness and bias going away anytime soon. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I did appreciate the comment comment about, you know, audits <laughs> being like, well, we don't know, you know, where are we coming in with the audit and, and the next day the system could change. So I do appreciate that, um, not least because we're having, you know, um, there's a lot of regulation that's coming down um, the pike this week, and I'm going to bring that in in just a second. Um, so that that was a great point. I have a question for both of you, um, which is, um, you know, given that we know about all the problems with AI, but we also kind of really appreciate what ChatGPT and the like can do. Um, if we 
you know, imagine talking to students or maybe to our children or the next generation. How would you, as sort of experts in the space, talk to, or how are you talking to your students or maybe your children about these technologies? Sort of the next generation who kind of really grows up with this technology specifically somewhat embedded into their lives. Fayesh, maybe you can go first. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I was just pulling up a link to a recent blog post that Arun wrote about this. So um, he actually set up a chat GPT voice interface uh, for his three-year-old. Um, and so like, I'll just quickly drop the link here. Oops, no, this is not the one. It's a very good read, plus, plus one to, <laughs> to that piece. Yeah, so what he did was like, it's basically a replacement of um, chat GPT, like basically replaces Siri on your mobile phone, say. Um, and so his three-year-old can now have a conversation with chat GPT. Of course, it's all like in the presence of guardrails and he describes it very well um, in the blog post as well. I do think at some level, like experience is the best teacher here. Like there's not too much sort of that we can um, sort of say. I think the key things to keep in mind though are exactly these sites, these sorts of uh, fail safes. So I think one example would be to not anthropomorphize um, things like chat GPT. So it's easy to believe that what you're talking to is a human-like interface. And I think it's important early on to stress um, that these technologies are not really agents. Um, ben Schneiderman pointed out that chat GPT, when it is giving out its responses, is also referring to itself in first person, which sort of gives it you know, this like aura of being a human. So like as an AI language model, I cannot and things like that. And these things are not like uh, pre-decided, right? We, it's, it's decided by OpenAI. And in fact, you can change the behavior of the system with just a simple prompt, which says, address yourself as in third person as chat GPT. Uh, and the, the response changes to um, as chat GPT and whatever, like it refer refers to itself uh, as a language model instead of as an agent. Um, so I think these sorts of design fixes can be something we can um, even show prototype very quickly. Um, so it would be like better to avoid that kind of anthropomorphization. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I think um, the one thing that I, I, I highlighted during the talk was our tendency to fall for automation bias. Uh, you all must have seen so many emails being floated around to academics, asking them for papers which have never been written. Um, I think those sorts of things you, you're very like sort of um, easily can fall into that trap. So once you start replacing Google with chat GPT or something like that, um, it might sound bizarre right now that someone could even think that a reference that chat GPT come, came up with was real. But for someone who's replaced half of the Google searches with uh, a large language model, I think those sorts of errors will, will become more and more likely. So I think getting ready for this next sort of stage of digital literacy almost, um, is, is something that we can do. Uh, and, and, and yeah, I think doing that through public outreach, through um, like these events like this one, I think all of these are, are, are very, very important. Yeah, and maybe uh, piggybacking on the pedagogical point, um, something that I and I know a lot of other faculty are working on right now is somewhat restructuring a lot of the uh, coding assignments that we're giving students. Um, and I think a lot of it is actually very much embracing ChatGPT because the genie is out of the bottle. It's not going to go away. We can't just say, you know, don't use ChatGPT and assume that it's going to work. Um, but I, I think it's really important to kind of a embrace that it is a tool that people will use head on, and b give students the tools that they need to be able to actually figure out what's hallucinating, what's misinformation, how do you fact check what ChatGPT is telling you. You know, if ChatGPT spits out code, can you tell if the code is correct or if there are issues with it? Um, and so instead of having smaller assignments being framed as write this code, it might be, what prompt did you use to ask GPT to uh, write this code? Um, what would you change about the code? How can you improve upon it? That sort of thing. Um, and so keeping it in the loop seems almost necessary <laughs> to some degree at this point. Um, but definitely with a very strong emphasis on the fact checking and you know awareness of hallucinations, that sort of thing. Yeah, thank you for that. And that of course also, you know, is important for educators like me who don't give coding assignments, but essay assignments, right? And so 
potential changes in the assignment structure could be also what prompt did you give and you know how do you assess what ChatGPT is actually giving you vis-a-vis -vis what we discussed in class and all of those things um we have a very active audience which is terrific so we already have plenty of questions in the chat so I'm going to actually move us into the Q&A part um, of the event I'm going to start with Megan's question, which I think is for Allison, and is as follows. How are speech-to-text models able to differ between race-based or race um, in voice? Um, is it provided before, beforehand or is the model trained to assume? So how is race actually identified in uh, right. speech-to-text models? Great question. The answer is basically neither um, race is not necessarily collected. It's just some speech that you get as like a WAV file or an MP3 file. And it just so happens that all of the speech that is spoken in African-American English always performs, nearly always performs significantly, significantly worse than speech that is in quote unquote standard American English. Um, and this is part of what I was getting at with the uh, hot take on Veris and Leo Technologies doing this sort of prison surveillance and saying, oh, actually, this is totally free of implicit bias because we don't collect any race data because there is no race data inherent in speech. And yet it does happen that based on the different acoustic features and grammatical patterns of different people from different locations speaking in a different way, those sorts of differences do end up um, playing a big role in the resulting transcriptions, even if no race data or geographic data is given. Thank you for that very succinct um, response, Allison. Sayash, I have one for you from Sanyu. How to check for GPT usage? Um, I, I assume this means like detecting whether a piece of content was outputted by like things like chat GPT. So I think this, this is like a real sort of need that was expressed by teachers all over the world when chat GPT was introduced, who were worried that the students were using chat GPT to answer like exam questions or, or something like that. Unfortunately, like my answer might not be very helpful. Um, I don't think it's very likely that in any like um, sort of near term scenario, we would be able to distinguish between um, like chat GPT created content versus human generated content with like any reasonable accuracy. OpenAI itself launched a classifier for AI detected text. Three, it missed three fourths of the content that was AI generated and like uh, outputted like the incorrect labels for that. Um, there are techniques that people are developing, things like watermarking um, outputs of LLMs. But the issue with those techniques is, is that it reduces um, the fidelity of the outputs like, quite a bit. Um, and so in general, I'm not sure if like any time in the near future, we would be able to detect if someone used ChatGPT for writing something. Um, and I do think that having like tools, and there are plenty of them, which claim to detect uh, AI detected AI written text, uh, text can also be harmful in a way. So for instance, I recently read this report about uh, these tools failing more often on people who were um, minoritized, uh, whereas they passed very easily if you even made slight changes to the prompt or asked uh, tools to sort of write it in a way that an AI model cannot detect it and you know, edit it even very slightly to make it seem like it was written by a human. Um, so I think with any promises, again, from vendors who are claiming to detect chat GPT, um, I think we should be careful to remember that these are also profit-driven companies, um, which are trying to sort of uh, like make a buck here too. So um, it's not like um, we, we have any silver bullet right now. And, and my guess is we won't have one for like a, 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 a while at least. Thank you for that, Sayesh. Really appreciate it. Um, Allison, I have a, a question that is a little bit in the weeds for you from Anna, who is asking, because of the ways in which LLMs work in terms of latent space, being the architectures on which the models train and sample their sequences and predictions, some have suggested that actually creating larger, more diverse data is not going to change or fix bias, but potentially increase it. It may in fact cause the models to hallucinate information even more. This means the problem of bias is architectural rather than data related per se. Just wondering what your thoughts are on this. Great, so, so I do have thoughts on this. Uh, so it'll be a multi-part answer. Uh, first point is that uh, a lot of what we're seeing on the ground isn't simply 
diversifying data more from you know a relatively even split to a more even split, it's like these companies for the most part did not have any dedicated black speakers in their data set that they went out and found. So if anything, it would have just been from existing large scale corpora that were already existing on the web um, from like phone calls, like literal landline phone calls um, and or from users, which as I mentioned with the whole positive feedback loop thing, you're getting very few black speakers. And so it's not, not a difference of saying like, oh, previously the data set was 10% black speakers. Now let's add some more data and make it 11%. You're going from like zero to 0 0.001. And that makes a, a massive difference in terms of how much you can improve on performance on a lot of these uh, minoritized speakers. So that's the first point in terms of just, you know, how are you doing this in the wild versus like in, in the ethers of, of a hypothetical toy model, what might this look like? Um, second point is a lot of what I hear when talking about, you know, encouraging more fairness by um, collecting more data um, is this idea that there is a trade-off between fairness and uh, performance or fairness and accuracy. Um, and I think this is also kind of a, a false choice. And oftentimes you don't actually need to sacrifice performance if you improve fairness by um, putting in uh, additional types of speech. Uh, so one example of this is based on transfer learning. So for example, a lot of the grammatical and phonological features of African-American English are actually very similar and overlapping with that of Southern dialects in the US, right? And so what you might be able to see is actually improving um, the performance of black speakers from the model can actually also improve the performance of Southern dialect speakers when they're using the model as well. Um, in any case, depending on how you build the model, even if you just put people into classifiers and then ensemble the model, you should be able to do at least as well as you did previously, if not better. So broadly the idea of like fairness versus performance also not necessarily at odds with each other. Um, and then I'll end with uh, a final kind of thought on the idea of kind of what, um, whether there are fundamental issues in the model separate to just this idea of training data, which I think of course there are, there's a lot of different ways in which we can improve. And one example of this uh, is actually looking at the gender disparities of speech to text models. And what you actually find consistently is that men uh, do a lot worse. Um, so not as the, the disparity between say black and white speakers is massive. And to, to that point of comparison, the, the difference between men and women is, is quite small. Um, but in just looking at uh, the gender difference uh, between uh, male speakers and female speakers, um, you see there's quite a large difference. And this is generally assumed to be because men tend to speak with more disfluencies in their speech. And so that's when uh, one might um, say things at not like a, a very uh, tempered cadence maybe uh, is one description of that. Um, but you wouldn't say that, oh, men are performing worse because there is no data of male speech existent on, on in the training data, right? Like the training data, if anything, is probably more heavily skewed towards men. Um, and so that's a point where the acoustic model could be improved upon. Terrific, thank you. Sayash, super short one from you, from you, please. Um, and I'm gonna um, sort of edit this a little bit. James is asking, uh, can you talk about appropriate use of AI? For example, creating base computer code quickly that can be modified and specialized. Now that we already talked about, so we don't need to talk about this again, but Sayash, I'm curious to hear from you taking the cue from the question about appropriate use of language AI or LLMs in the professions, because that's something I'm also very interested in. Oh, that's a that's a great, that's a great question. And I've been thinking about this quite a bit recently too. So I think one thing that we sort of wrote about a while back was the use of LLMs for writing fiction or the use of LLMs for entertainment more generally. Um, so the main issue with LLMs these days is hallucination, right? Like you cannot rely on the information they output. Or actually, I shouldn't say the main, it's one of the main issues. Um, the fact that entertainment or fiction does not really have this notion of truth means that you can bypass this issue entirely. Um, and we've already seen cases where, for instance, there are people who write period dramas or people who are like self-published authors on um, like Amazon's Kindle platform have used things like GPT-3 to become like much more productive than they used to earlier. Uh, they have fans who sort of wait on like a 12 week schedule for the next novel release. And it's always like a struggle to hit it. 
but with tools like GPT-3 and like, sorry, GPT-4 and chat GPT, I think it's become a bit easier for them. So I think in general, like tools about tools that are uh, sort of geared towards entertainment would, would be one criteria which sort of very easily um, fits the bill. And this also extends to things on social media. So for instance, and there have been like tons of examples of chat GPT screenshots. I think all of us are pretty bored of those by now, but at the time it came out, I think that really was something that was performing its vital role of educating the public about capability. So uh, you would learn more about the limitations of chat GPT based on like 10 screenshots than spending like 20 minutes with it or whatever. Um, so I think those sorts of like things, especially because AI is still nascent, chat GPT is still nascent, despite being used by 100 million people, it's just six months old right now. Um, I think at least right now, it's it's very useful to have that UI, to have something that you can play around with um, and, and communicate widely about, about its limitations. So um, yeah, perhaps perhaps those two, and definitely like plus one to the coding point, I've already used it um, even for analysis of uh, chat GPT myself. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite useful for that purpose too. That's very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, Alison, equally brief one um, for you and from you. Um, this is from Salman. We know LLMs can exacerbate issues around the spread of fake news and disinformation, which can undermine the credibility of journalism as a whole. Can LLMs be designed to detect bias and misinformation in news and remove it? So there is actually an entire stream of literature that works on kind of detection of fake news and such, um, which I would actually liken very much also to playing whack-a-mole um, because the types of fake news that pop up uh, are changing all the time. And so the research has been trying to keep up, um, but this sort of classification work is difficult, but definitely there, there are people working on this. Yeah, and that of course also is in some ways um, a business concern, right? For um, social media companies who have to respond to um, regulation, um, which also is different in different uh, geographies and territories. So in Europe, for example, much stricter um, regulation around that. Sayash, next one is for you from Joseph, who thanks you for the talk or thanks both of you for the talk. Um, and so Sayash, um, you mentioned that critical AI researchers have fallen behind in making the point to the public that human intelligence isn't interchangeable with AI. I'm wondering what our panelists feel should be done here. Is it a question of simply needing to write more op-eds about this, or are there other strategies that should be used? Yeah, I wish I wish I had like a very nice answer for this question. I think it's a very important question, um, perhaps like the question of the decade for uh, critical researchers. Um, I think my my like I think my answer would be like twofold. So the first is, in the last ten years, responsible AI has become a very sort of almost mainstream thing as well. Um, but in large part, this entire push towards responsible AI was happening at company's expense. So there was this period, like brief decade looking back, where we felt that we could be funded by tech companies and yet do work that would be critical of them and yet sort of hold them accountable. With the tech layoffs of the last couple of months or the last six months, I should say, I think it's become clear that that's not really a viable option or that can't be the only option that we're looking at, right? Um, so with Microsoft laying off its entire responsible AI team um, in Canada, um, with Facebook and Google layoffs disp disproportionately affecting its responsible AI teams. I think that sort of illusion is the first thing we need to leave behind. Uh, the fact that companies will fund research that can sort of uh, uh, affect them in any meaningful terms. Uh, but beyond that, I think there is a need for sort of alternative modes of thinking then. So if, if we are not funded by tech companies, like who funds us? It's in a moment of crisis for science as well. It's a moment of crisis for a journalism, I think, where like the reason journalists are presumably be, pre presumably coming up with clickbaity headlines is not that um, they they want to mislead the public; it's because they're reliant on clicks now for 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 funding. Um, so I think we need to sort of think about changes more at the root rather than thinking about surface level changes. Um, and I think one way to go about it is to stop stop being like reactive. And and by that I don't mean that like the whack-a-mole approach that Alison has mentioned is reactive. But by that, I mean being prepared for the next wave. So 
Um, with ChatGPT, I think it took a full couple of months for the critical community to sort of get into it and sort of start dissecting ChatGPT for what it is. Um, and I think by being more proactive, by th seeing things like that are on the horizon for, for like a longer term range um, is, is, is more important now. So just to give you an example, like the Stochastic Parrots paper came out in December of 2020. There was two full years ahead of ChatGPT's launch. Um, but I think that is the sort of like vision that we need to have for uh, what future changes can potentially affect um, like our technological futures and not just sort of reacting to what tech companies are doing in the moment, but also thinking like just a little bit later, not getting caught up in the latest sort of uh, press cycle. Yeah, I, I, I hope that's that's helpful. I'm, I'm, I don't know if this is like a good answer, but uh, it's the best I have right now. Allison, can I actually, I, yeah, I, I would love to chime in on this because I also want to tie it back into Sayash's talk because there are a few really interesting points there that I wanted to maybe re-highlight. Um, but my short answer to Joseph's question is, I think it's really important to have humans in the loop for any sort of AI, right? So at baseline, it's really important to combine both human expert knowledge with AI knowledge. I think most people agree that that's kind of like both the practical and the ideal path forward. Um, but going back to Sasha's talk where a lot of it was about evaluation and you know, like what is the right level of evaluation to have for a lot of these things. Um, so one thought is kind of tying back to speech to text where, where I always go. Um, in 2019, Taylor Jones, Taylor Jones et al. Um, came out with this paper on court transcriptions. Um, and they actually found that the human court transcribers, both white and black court transcribers, did worse on black speech relative to white speech. Um, and the way that court transcription works is that in order to get this job, you as a human actually have to like pass a certain error rate. So you have to get at least a certain percentage share of accuracy on speech. Um, and so they had all you know, cleared that bar uh, by far for white speakers, um, but with black speakers, even the black court transcribers weren't able um, to transcribe the words at the right level of accuracy. Now the black transcribers were able um, to get the right uh, kind of paraphrase error rate. So they understood what, what was meant, but maybe some of the double negatives weren't getting transcribed entirely and that sort of thing. And so this is a great example of where, you know, maybe you want your AI to replace humans because like the humans aren't good enough, but also the humans probably understand fundamentally what these things actually mean more than ChatGBT, which doesn't have any inherent understanding of things. Um, and then the other thought in terms of evaluations is, you know, there's also the question of should we even be using like human performance as a benchmark? Um, Samuel Bowman has a really great piece, um, eight thing, eight things about LLMs. <laughs> I'm butchering <laughs> what the actual title is. Um, but one of the points, um, one of the eight points is this idea of like, actually this thing is like trained on the entire internet. And so it should be far outperforming humans. And so there's no real reason that we should think about like, the average human on uh, the LSAT or whatever um, as kind of the relevant benchmark. Um, point being, humans in the loop is is kind of my short answer. Thank you both for this. Um, I have a question that I think is really interesting and important um, about um, education. And Marianne is um, saying they are an academic, a librarian looking to build tutorials about AI that are standalone or could be integrated into courses at my university. In addition to issues of bias related to training, training data slash mis misinformation slash hallucinations uh, slash evaluating sources, I was also thinking about using or adapting the 18 pitfalls document to provide learners with a means of recognizing or critically thinking about AI technology. And I was curious whether you think that would work. Any of you who wants to take this one? Um, yeah, I think I would be like flattered if you use it in your course. Uh, I do know like a couple of people have used it for their academic courses, like specifically creating assignments around um, news articles and using the checklist to analyze biases or like um, hype in, in the articles. Um, so yeah, if you do end up using it, I would be very, very excited to hear what comes of it. Great, and we got a thumbs up from Allison as well. Wonderful. Um, so 
I am looking at the time. We have about five minutes left and a lot more questions. Um, Alison, there's a question for you from Beth, who is um, saying, we've been talking a lot about ChatGPT, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or critical reflections ha, about OpenAI's whisper system. Great, we get to talk about this one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it works very well. Whisper works very well. Um, maybe one thing I'll say that I think is something that is actually founded because it's it's in the Whisper paper itself um, that I think is interesting is uh, the attempt to expand out into different, especially low resource languages. Um, I think it's clear that that's the direction that a lot of speech to text is trying to go in terms of collecting more low resource language data. Um, but one of the figures in their paper actually shows like a, a number of hours of training data on the x-axis and the y-axis is like accuracy or word error rate or some metric along those lines. Um, and one thing that you might not notice on the first time reading the figure, but you might if you go back and look at it more closely, is that the x-axis is actually on a log scale. And so the lowest resource languages have like less than an hour of speech data that they're being trained on. Some of them are like, I think the lowest one is six minutes of speech data. And it's like, yes, we know it's lower resource, but probably we can do more than like less than an hour of data. Um, and so I think that is going to be a big point of probably improvement on the horizon is just collection of this low resource uh, language data and possibly working more on transfer learning um, across languages. So that's kind of one angle uh, to think about Whisper. Thanks so much for that. Um, Alison, we're going to stay with you for just a minute. Laura has a question that kind of follows up on the court um, example that you gave. And they're asking, should Black slash Southern English speakers in court have simultaneous interpreters like foreign languages in order to make transcriptions more reliable? So I would argue no, because for the most part, humans can understand these speakers far better um, than you know, the physical act of transcribing. Um, the major issue for court transcribers is they have to listen and also literally type out all of these words in shorthand. Um, but as far as humans like you or I listening to any of these snippets, um, and maybe I'll, I'll do a quick plug, if you go to fairspeech.stanford.edu, um, there are a lot of uh, utterances that you can listen to of Black speakers. Uh, and for the most part, I, I think you will find that if you can understand English, uh, you will be um, able to understand most of these snippets with no problem. And yet the accuracy is very low for a lot of um, the speech to text services that we evaluate. Thank you for that, Alison, and for sort of bringing the distinction between transcription and meaning making also, right? Which seems right. to still be a uniquely human trait. Um, Sayers, so I have one for you, and then I'm going to close this off with one for both of you. Um, this is from the Kita who's um, saying, well, this is not related to language models, but as an aspiring software engineer, what do you think about the implications of AI on the role of software engineers, Sayash? Yeah, this is this is a tough one. Um, so making predictions is always hard um, and like it's, it's it can go either way, but so for what it's worth, I think tools like ChatGPT will make software engineering like software engineers much more productive so at least in the near term i feel like um if you have access to chat gpt you would be more productive than someone who doesn't um the sort of broader societal implications are that you know we're living under capitalism and so this also means that companies are keeping a watch do you can you do the same work with like fewer people that's always the question being asked and especially with like the tech layoffs for the last six months we've, we know that companies are looking for a way to cut costs and so on um, so I think it's, it's a bind because you have this tool, which is like extremely useful, can be extremely useful in like writing code more quickly, um, writing the boring parts of code more quickly, like creating templates for you and so on. And at the same time, it can also be used as a tool against the profession of software engineers. Um, so, so I'm unsure, like, um, maybe for indie software developers, it'll be a boon, but for like people who are working in tech more broadly, it might end up. Uh, sort of applying this uh, labor displacement force um, from the side. Thank you for that. And I have a question for both of you. Um, and the, I'm taking the cue from Ed. Um, 
who is saying is there more um is there more source more stuff on critical ai to help us keep track of the subject social um related social media or post podcasts any of that sort and that's kind of a, a cue for you to both kind of also showcase your public uh scholarship so sayash any any sort of sources to keep track of the topic yeah um i think in terms of like broader outreach i really like a few podcasts so tech won't save us is one of my favorites um, Emily Bender and Alex Hanna do this thing called um, Mystery AI Hype Theater, which is really nice. Um, Arun and I have been writing a book, as I mentioned, so we also have a blog called AISnakeOil.substack.com. Um, so yeah, I think um, that's that's probably enough to get started on. I think all of these have like a lot of content. Yeah, and for me, uh, I know a lot of um, folks in kind of this space have been on the Ezra Klein show, and so that's a good resource to hear kind of what people are thinking about. Um, and otherwise, uh, I actually really like Sayash's advisor, Arvind's Twitter. Um, highly encourage people to follow Arvind's Twitter. Great, yes, I second all of these and I will of course also add co-opting AI is also a great place for you to go um, and explore these topics. All of our videos are also on the IPK YouTube channel um, across broad range of topics, you know, from food to religion to intimacy. Today we talked about language. Um, we talk about everything that um, is related to AI in our contemporary lives. And with that, I want to close us off and extend a Massive thanks to Dr. Allison Kinnicky and Sayesh Kapoor. Thank you both so much for joining us today. I really appreciated your contributions and the energy that you brought to the space. Thank you massively to our audience and to our supporters, to Sam Employ, who kind of worked everything in the tech background. We will be back soon with the next co-opting AI event on May 9th on classification, which I'm very excited about with Den Baug, with Joffrey Bauker and Sarita Mucha. So this will be a wonderful conversation. Please join us again. And for now, thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of the week and a great weekend. Take good care. <laughs>